Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of Smithsonian Social Studies Online. Today, we are going to be talking about the question, how is power gained, used, justified, and revoked? I'm Abby Fischer. I'm an education specialist at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And I'm so thrilled to be joined by my colleagues, Vanessa Jones and Orlando Serrano, who will tell you a little bit more about this. But before I hand it over to them, just a couple quick things to keep in mind today. Um, Orlando and Vanessa are here to answer your questions throughout today's webcast. And you can share your questions with them by putting them into the chat box to the right. So we welcome your questions about their content, about museum practice, about the Smithsonian, and about social studies in general. And as you do answer your question or ask your questions, please be sure to keep all of your private information private. We don't need that. And if you are a teacher or a parent watching with your student, we encourage you to watch together and think about your questions and what we're talking about today. So thanks for being here. And Orlando, hand it to you. Thank you, Abby. First of all, folks, apologize for that small technical uh, mishap that we just had. Um, but yeah, no, I want to add on a little bit to what Abby said. Please ask us any social studies questions, but any art questions, too, because we have someone who is with us today from the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, Vanessa, thank you for joining us. And we will transition shortly to talk about some of the cultural resources that you pulled out of a larger collection, and we're excited about that. Uh, but before we do, can you introduce yourself a little bit more to our viewers, to our audience? You know, what is it that you do at the Portrait Gallery? How did you get there? And you know, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? What are some projects that you're working on right now? Sure, hi everybody. So my name is Vanessa and I've been working at the Portrait Gallery for about five years now. Um, I work in the education department, so I am an educator with a background in museum education and art history. But in my practice, I actually focus on visitors with disabilities. So a lot of what I do is programmatic, developing programs for different groups of people with disabilities, um, people who uh, are blind or have low vision, or people with memory loss. In fact, yesterday we did a virtual program for a group of people with memory loss and their care partners. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of my work is programmatic, but I also work cross-departmentally to ensure that accessibility is sort of integrated in the work that we do across our institution, mm -hmm. that other staff members are thinking about it, and that you know, to the extent possible, everything that we put out there um, is thinking about uh, visitors with disabilities, whether it's in our museum or whether it's visiting our website, um, et cetera. So, um, so I have a background, as I mentioned, in art history and museum education um, and uh, have been working in museum education in different capacities over the years. Um, I myself have a disability, so it's been kind of interesting now for me to focus on this particular audience, which I did not earlier in my career. So it's been a great sort of bringing together of my own personal experience um, with my professional expertise. Uh, Vanessa, thank you very much for sharing with us. I mean, and yeah, that that's, uh, you know, to Abby's point that she brought up earlier today, if you have any questions about museum practice or education practice, you know, um, Sometimes we don't, you know, think about accessibility and we, we might have some, you know, uh, an exhibit design, you know, uh, something that I'm learning about is like leaving room for a cane sweep, you know, small, mm -hmm. small um, adjustments that we can make that benefit everybody that we don't often think about. So if you have any questions about design for access, please feel free to ask those today as well. Definitely. Um, all right, um, Vanessa, now before we, we move on, um, I wanna remind folks that if they have any questions, they can put them in the chat box. And I'd like to hear a little bit about, you know, the collection that you're pulling from today, which we'll get to at the end in terms of how folks can access the larger collection. Can you tell us about how you selected some of the cultural resources and the frame that you put around them to get at the question that we're working on today, which is, you know, how is power gained, used, justified, and revoked. Sure. So, you know, pow portraiture is powerful. Um, it's much more than just a likeness or, or a record of someone. Um, it, it shapes our cultural narratives, the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and what's important. Um, and, you know, portraiture has the power to 
empower people by telling their stories, but it also has had the power to uh, disempower people by excluding stories. And so there's a, a couple of themes, uh, I think, that run through these portraits we're going to look at today. One is the way in which power can be reflected within portraiture, how we read portraits. And the other is the way that artists nowadays are using portraiture as an art form uh, or as a tool to kind of address some of address issues of power and, you know, typically uh, issues of historical imbalances in power. So those okay. are sort of the two themes running through, um, I think, what we'll talk about today. Thank you for that, Vanessa. We'll definitely come back to those as touchstones as we move through. And we will start with our first resource here, and it is uh, Rosa Parks. And it's a great place to start. You know, lots of folks are familiar with Rosa Parks' story, but can you say a little bit about how she and her actions relate to our question today? And then for folks who maybe are novices at art analysis, can you walk us through how we would go about, you know, looking at the different pieces of this to get a larger sense of what the artist is communicating. Okay, so the first question, I'm sorry, say the first question again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second yeah. one. Absolutely. <laughs> how, 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 how do you see Rosa Parks fitting into the, the story that you're trying to tell today right. about folks, you know, reflecting power in, in portraiture? Sure. So um, this is a portrait that captures a particular moment um, of, in history that many people have heard of, right? It's the moment when Rosa Parks has just refused to surrender her seat uh, in a bus to a white man as law, as law required at the time. And she is arrested for that and, and put in jail. And so this portrait captures that moment when she's arrested. And so, you know, I, I selected this portrait because I think it's an example. There's, there's the story itself, uh, where power plays out. Um, we see a woman who is disempowered by a, a, a system, a set of laws, but who uh, through her actions, through civil disobedience, she reclaims a sense mm -hmm. of power and a sense of agency. So there's that story of, of how she's reclaiming the power. And then there's also, if we read the portrait, we can see how the artist has imbued her with a sense of power. Yeah, can you say a little bit uh, more about that? Um, but before I, I give it back to you, for you to unpack this a little bit for us, I wanna let uh, folks who are joining us know a little bit about how to use the Learning Lab resources. So, you know, this, when you open up a tile, you'll see the image. If you click on the eye, you'll get more information, some of the metadata or description about the image. And anytime there's a paper clip here, Click on that as well, and you can get some more context with a book icon. And if there's a question mark, there are some guiding questions. And Vanessa, I take it this is to help us analyze the art, correct? Yes. Um, some of these resources, uh, these are questions that we use in our school programs with students or sometimes with teachers to, to work with their students. OK. So um, let's go back to our discussion about what the artist does um, with the, the the composition of this piece and how the artist is communicating with it uh, to us and what Rosa Parks' story means, right? If we look at the side, can you say more about this view of this of this yeah. uh, resource? So, yeah, so in at the portrait gallery, when we're analyzing a portrait, we use something, we're basically looking for clues in the portrait, right? To help us understand uh, the deeper meaning of the portrait. And we call these the elements of portrayal. And what we're mm -hmm. looking at are things like pose, scale, the dress, the expression, the medium, so the material that the, uh, that the artist has selected, selected, any objects or props in the portrait, um, and the artistic style. So those are some of the clues we look at. And so in this portrait, if, if you don't mind going back to the frontal view just for a moment. Absolutely. Um, you know, what we see here is we see Rosa Parks in the center and she's flanked on either side by these tall, ominous figures. They're taller than she is. So you might immediately or initially think that they're more powerful. But if you look at them more carefully, you notice how they're sort of shaped in a triangle. And as you move up the figures, 
they become smaller at the top with these very small heads and they're wearing glasses. So, um, you know, in a sense, there's, there's a lack of individuation or individuality mm -hmm. to these individuals. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas with Rosa Parks, you can see her eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, there's a bit of an irony here too, if we look at the color, she's wearing patriotic colors, red, white, and blue. The two men who are law enforcement figures, as we can see, mm -hmm. are wearing these bland colors. So again, mm -hmm. alluding to this, to this blandness, this lack of individuality, they're almost, the two figures that are clasping her arms are almost like symbolic. Mm -hmm. uh, all the individuals, all the people historically who've, who've contributed to the system of oppression. So they're more symbolic. Whereas Rosa Parks is really humanized. Mm -hmm. um, and if, at this point, if you wanna go to the side view, we see this again, how she is portrayed in this, as this full human being. Um, she has a three dimensionality to her. Um, whereas the other two figures, you know, they're barely visible. They're very, very slim. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, I mean, to sort of build off what we were saying on the previous slide, they're anonymous. I mean, you know, yeah. for, for folks who, you know, teach language arts, you know, we often talk about how we don't, we don't um, want to create flat characters. <laughs> and that's that definitely is seen as something that is not great for storytelling, but for character development, individuality. And we see the artist doing that very, very real work here. Right, right. And, and Vanessa, I really appreciate you walking us through those elements for folks who maybe did not catch that. You know, Vanessa mentioned when we look at art, we want to look, or portraiture, I apologize. We want to look at pose, scale, dress, expression, medium, and props. And you kind of quickly walked us through that, that progression. Um, so I just want to add well. that um, one of the things that we often ask our students is to, to notice Rosa Parks' expression. You mm -hmm. notice how she's looking off into the distance and, you know, you might initially think that maybe she is looking timid, but many times students come around as they look more closely to seeing that really what they're seeing is she's taking a stand and she has a sense of determination about her um, in her expression. So in that sense, the artist is, is really empowering her individually. Thank you. All right, we are gonna shift and talk about our, our next cultural resource here. Um, now, folks may are, are likely familiar with Rosa Parks, but folks may not be as familiar with our, our next, you know, subject here. So can you please tell us a little bit about Belva and Lockwood and why you selected this portrait? Yes, yeah, so you're absolutely right. She's definitely lesser known. Um, so Belva Ann Lock, Lock, Lockwood was born in 1830, so, and died in 1917. Um, and she was just this incredible, um, radical woman in a sense. Um, she was a lawyer, she was a teacher, she was a social activist, a feminist. Um, she, was, she actually ran for president. She um, initially, she um, studied law, but was not able to receive her diploma because she was a woman. Um, she was someone who fought for people who were typically marginalized. So women, of course, Native Americans, people living in poverty, people without education. Um, so she was really someone who dedicated her life to progressive causes. And um, she was, you know, became pretty well known during her life. And during the end of her life, there was a group of women who raised money to have this portrait made of her. And the portrait dates from 1913. So it was created um, a few years before she died. Okay. And so she was a woman who uh, lived in a time when women didn't have a lot of power, but she sort of claimed a sense of power for herself through her education and through her you know, formidable intellect. Mm -hmm. And the artist shows her power uh, in her dress, if you, if you are, yeah, if you can zoom in a little bit, you can see that she's wearing this beautiful dark velvet mm -hmm. robes, so academic robes. Um, okay. And in one of her hands, her right hand, she's holding a scroll, likely a diploma. Mm -hmm. um, and the portrait itself is quite large. It's actually about six foot high. So she is okay. presented almost lifelike. 
So if you imagine that portrait hanging on the wall a few feet up and you're looking at her, you know, the way you even interact with her is she, she comes across as a very yeah. powerful woman. It's definitely towering, you know, well, especially for me who stands that five, five, right? <laughs> <laughs> she's she's going to be a rather imposing figure. No, yes, right? absolutely. And, and again, I, Vanessa, I want to uh, thank you for pointing out the different elements of portraiture that we want to keep in mind. So in this one, really scale is, is something mm -hmm. that the artist is using to communicate. All right, we will move on to our next cultural resource. And this is, uh, I had not, I don't remember seeing this. And I, I want to say that when I first saw the Let Share This Collection, I was really taken aback by it. Mm -hmm. And uh, a friend of mine is a poet, and her first collection is actually called Mistress, and it's about Sally Hemings. And we see here in in this um, portrait, which is called, for folks who did not catch it before I closed it, Behind the Myth of Benevolence. Um, we've got some some history or some some important people who we need to recognize behind Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. So can you tell us about this, please? Yeah, there's a lot going on here. So this is a very interesting piece. It's by an artist named Titus Kafar, who's a contemporary artist. I think he's in his 30s now. Um, and, you know, just the title itself is very interesting, The Myth of Bene Benevolence, right? So who's who's supposedly benevolent here? Um, and what's the myth that has been perpetuated historically? So what Titus Kafar does is um, he basically, um, he sort of reconfigures um, and regenerates art history to include the African-American subject and story. So he tells a story um, where he was studying art history at university and the professor is going through all of these uh, canonical works of art history. And he's mm -hmm. like, where are the people of color? Where mm -hmm. are these stories? And so he set out as an artist to sort of tell those the stories of, of, of the invisible people of our history, people who contributed to history, who played an important part, but who do not show up in art history. And this is a way in which portraiture can be really powerful because it can sort of fill those gaps. And that's what some contemporary portraitists or artists, including Titus Scafar, are doing. And so what you see here is you see this image of, um, Thomas Jefferson, and it's a recreation of a real portrait of Thomas Jefferson. I'm forgetting now who the artist is, but it's an existing portrait. And then what Titus Kafar has done is he has drawn an image of Sally Hemings. Of course, we don't know what she looks like. And we know that the real Sally Hemings was fair skinned. She was actually mm -hmm. mixed race. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, this image is not really of Sally Hemings individually. It's representative of all the Sally Hemings of history. Mm -hmm. And so he's giving her a voice. She's peeking out from behind um, Thomas Jefferson. And she's, you know, she's sort of reclaiming her space. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sorry, go ahead, Orlando. No, I was just, I mean, I, 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 I want to go back to one of the touchstones that you gave us early on about how we can think about portraiture um, and how folks are using portraits to address power. And I mean, they're both it's it's what one of the interesting parts of this piece is that both are looking out at us except that, that sally is sort of covering up Jefferson, you know and in his portrait and saying there's more to the story than what you have learned and i'm stepping out and and want to be noticed as well which is you know uh, it seems like a and i appreciate that you mentioned this as a contemporary artist you know the the first two seem to soak focus, you know, on social activists. This one right. seems to be a hint at like how art itself can be activist, right? Exactly. And art, art making, you know, as you said earlier, can be used to, to address power. Right. So in this sense, it's the artist who's the activist. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, going back to the title, The Myth of Benevolence, some of you may have heard Thomas Jefferson having been referred to the benevolent slave owner you know, and so Titus Kafar is questioning that, like, what is benevolent about a slave owner mm -hmm. and about a man who has six children with a woman over whom he has complete power? Yeah. So in a sense, Titus Kafar, and if you have a chance to look at other artworks he's done, and there's a TED talk in the, um, the resources that we've compiled that 
we'll share with people later, where he talks about his um, art making practice. But what he's really trying to do is correct historical narratives. Um, and thereby he's you know, reclaiming power, as I mentioned, for people whose stories have not been told. Okay. All right, well, we are gonna take a moment. Uh, we're about two thirds of our way through our time together. And we have a, a few more resources to look at. But if anyone has any questions, we'd like to pause here. Any comments, Abby? Well, I have to say, there's been a wonderful conversation going on in the comments section, um, just in reflecting on what you all have been talking about, how um, Belva Ann Lockwood looks like a minister with a stole and with the purple of the royal color, and just the power of that. And also about the the um, palette of the Rosa Parks figure, um, the khaki and the olive drab, and how that really speaks to power relationships. So I just wanted to share what a wonderful conversation you all are inspiring. Um, and just how powerful this conversation has been. So send it back to you. Wonderful. All right. All right. So <laughs> this, this is great. This is awesome. Um, this is one of um, my favorite pieces in the portrait gallery. You know, I listened to LL Cool James growing up and I can 100% attest to the fact that ladies do love Cool James <laughs> because I knew many a young woman who were smitten by him. Um, can you tell us about this? Why did you include this uh, portrait? And for those of folks who maybe didn't catch it, we saw, this is actually the second Kahinda Wiley piece that we have in this collection because we saw President Obama earlier on, right, right behind Rosa Parks. You know, it's a little Easter egg we put in there for you today. Mm -hmm. um, go back and check it out. But why, why L O Cool J? So this artist, right, as you mentioned, or sorry, this paint portrait was made by Kahinda Wiley, who's another really incredible contemporary artist. Um, and it's another example of an artist who uses portraiture to, to challenge traditional power dynamics, but he does it in a little bit of a different way. Um, and so what he's done here, you see this image of um, LL Cool J, he's sitting on, on this velvet cushion, mm -hmm. almost throne-like. Um, he's wearing the, the jewelry, this incredibly rich decorative wallpaper in the background that sort of references the kind of silk wallpaper you might find in a royal palace in Europe. Um, in the upper right corner, you see um, this kind of a crest or royal um, symbol. Um, I don't know if you're able to zoom in. There's a, a boxing gloves and a boom box. So those are references to um, LL Cool J <laughs> as a rap artist. And so, and he's looking up at us also, um, with you know, sort of an intimidating uh, kind of expression, um, and so if you if you want to go to the next um, image, um, I'd like to show the the portrait of of Rockefeller, um, and I think you know viewers can immediately see the similarity in the pose, right? Mm -hmm. They're seated in exactly the same way, a very similar expression, and so what uh, Wiley has done is he has taken this portrait, this this very portrait done in this grand master, sort of very traditional um, manner of European manner of painting. And he's uh, portrayed this, this, you know, African American hip hop artist in the same manner that you have uh, a, a white wealthy, you know, mm -hmm. Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's an interesting way for him to kind of play with these power dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, he, <laughs> and they definitely remixed the portrait, right? I mean, or the yeah. portraiture as style. And, you know, I, I appreciate you pointing out the crest and what is in the crest, you know, because El Okude also always used to wear this Kangol hat. Right. And he could not live without his radio. <laughs> and it was one of his hits. So <laughs> it's really, great how that is all in the crest there and you know uh the comparison to rockefeller is striking i mean the chair the pose the mm -hmm. the look at to the viewer is is really incredible all right we're gonna you know move on to this is another one of my favorites mm -hmm. and you know my my partner happens to be a biochemist, so Henrietta Lacks is required reading. She also <laughs> did did research on cancer cells. I know about Hela sixty, um, but can you can you tell us about 
and why you included this group in our collection today and how Henrietta Lacks and her story talks about and gets that power. Yeah, so this is another really visually beautiful portrait, right? Just in terms of the color, but Henrietta Lacks is another one of those um, important individuals in American history whose story has not been told. Um, and in fact, she wasn't really well known until a book was written about her, I believe in, in 2010. And then an H HBO did a special in 2017. And that's the same year that this portrait was made. Um, and so what's import so important about her is that um, she was a woman who had cancer. And when a biopsy was taken of her, this is, I believe, in the late 1940s, because she died in 1941 of her cervical, uh, sorry, 51 of her cervical cancer, um, doctors realized that her cells reproduced indefinitely, amazingly well in a way that other cells didn't. And so her cells were taken to create what's now called the HeLa, H-E-L-A from her name, cell line. And so she's really made a huge contribution to um, the medical and scientific community because her cell lines now are all over the world being used by scientists in, in, in um, research. And she was unknown in her, she, she was not, um, her, her, she was not asked for consent to take her cells and her family was not originally compensated either. So I think it's, it's an interesting story of, of sort of medical and scientific ethics. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, um, and it, yes, it's a beautiful portrait and um, I'm sorry, what was the other question, the follow-up question? Oh, no, no. Sort of it's getting lost in her biography. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, you, you got it. I mean, in terms of how, how this relates to issues of power, right? I mean, you right. had here someone, interestingly enough, who did not consent to have her cells harvested. Right. And so in one regard, power dynamics were such that she, you know, she be, she sort of got lost in history because she was just an honest person. But then the way in which paint has come back um, recently and the paradigm is sort of shifting where folks are trying to recognize the contribution of this woman to some we pointed out um, right now that a lot of the research that's done on cancer is dependent on her cells that, you know, have been around forever. And as someone has pointed out, uh, I, I want to say some, I don't know who these folks are in the chat, but doing a great job of pointing out the wallpaper um, yeah. that, that, that definitely resemble is uh, similar to, it looks like cell structure, but if we look at the uh, information here, we can see it's the flower of life, the symbols of mortality because her cells are still with us today. Right. Um, and right. W one of the, one of the parts that I, I didn't notice and you know, one of the folks uh, Tia pointed out is that she definitely has a halo, <laughs> you know, yes. and, and and I had not noticed that before. Yes. So this is a, actually quite a symbolic um, portrait. The artist Nelson Kadir, or, or sorry, Kadir Nelson has um, infused a lot of symbolism. You picked up on the wallpaper symbolizing the flower of life. It's actually the flowers on her dress that are meant to mm -hmm. symbolize reproducing cells. Um, and if you notice the buttons uh, on her dress, there are a couple that are missing if, as you go towards yeah. her belt. And those yeah. are meant to symbolize what was taken from her. Um, she's she's uh, holding a Bible. She was a woman of very strong faith, um, you know, wearing this deep blue dress, uh, sorry, deep red dress. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to note that when this portrait was first hung in our galleries in starting in 2018 it was hung right at the entrance of our g street entrance and so you know we really what we were trying to say as a as a museum was you know we are trying to tell some of these stories mm -hmm. these narratives that have been um not been told um and this is actually the first the only oil painting of henrietta mm -hmm. lax wow that's 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 a wonderful story and uh, it's great that you know you all are highlighting some of these folks who ha whose stories have not been told or highlighted before, and we do want to end with one final uh, cultural resource. Can you please walk us through Eunice Kennedy Shriver and what this portrait is doing here? Sure. 
So to me, this portrait is really more about the individuals that surround her. So Eunice Shriver was known as the founder of the Special Olympics. And um, these individuals that surround her are actually real individuals who are, who are or were spe Special Olympics athletes. And, um, you know, I thought it was important to include this because I work on accessibility mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the voices of people with disabilities have always, have, have historically been excluded. Um, and so I love that we have this portrait on view in our Struggle, of Just, Just Struggle for Justice exhibition. Mm -hmm. And um, you notice on the right side of the portrait, the, it's quite, quite dark. And yeah. then as you move left, there's this um, light sort of halo-like. Um, and that's really, I think, meant to symbolize that as a society, as we are integrating um, and including people with disabilities, we're really moving from darkness to lightness. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going to a better place. So it's it's mm -hmm. really hopeful. Um, wonderful. Uh, sorry, our uh, postal um, carrier just came by, letting me know we got <laughs> packages. So I waved. Uh, <laughs> and one, it's Vanessa. Thank you for for ending on you know, possibility, right? And, yeah. you know, that that as we struggle for justice and inclusion, that we can create different futures and different presents for folks. So I, I definitely appreciate you ending on a, on a hopeful note. Um, and I, I want to thank you for being with us today. Um, we are just about out of time. Um, if any folks have any questions, Abby, did anything come up in the chat that I missed that, that we can address? I know you did such a great job of picking up on the incredible observations that everyone is making. Um, just, I'm, I'm having a great time reading the chat because our, our viewers today are so um, engaged with this content and it's wonderful, but no questions to share. All right, all right. Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Vanessa did pull some of these pieces from a larger learning lab collection called Power and Portraiture. And we will put these in the comments. Uh, for you all to be able to have access to, please check them out. There's more context. There's you know some more thinking exercises to help you understand how to look at portraiture and how to analyze it. Again, I mean, I wrote down my notes for next time I go to the portrait gallery, whenever that happens to be. Uh, pose, scale, draft, <laughs> expression, medium, props. These are the clues I need to be looking at um, and looking for as an art detective. And that's right. I want to thank you all out there for joining us. Vanessa, I want to thank you for being thank with you. us it was today. A pleasure. Yeah, and our resources are here. Again, this will live in the, in the comment section. And I do want to remind you all that next week we will be talking about this question. Whose stories do we tell and who gets to tell them? So hope to see you then. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Abby. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.